Over the last few months, a number of you have emailed in asking questions about Volvo's T8 plug-in hybrid system, how it's changed recently, how it stacks up against the competition, and basically what's unique about this plug-in hybrid setup. That's why I've borrowed a 2023 Volvo S60 Recharge. This has under its hood and under the back, Volvo's new 455 horsepower plug-in hybrid setup. You'll find this not just in the S60, but also the XC60, the XC90, etc. We don't, however, find it in the Volvo XC40, which still fills me with a little bit of sadness because a 455 horsepower XC40 would be a ton of fun. On the surface of things, Volvo's plug-in hybrid system seems an awful lot like the Hyundai, the Kia, and the BMW plug-in hybrid systems. We have a traditional automatic up front, turbocharged engine, all-wheel drive on board. But when you start scratching the surface, you'll realize this is quite different than either of those setups. Versus the BMW system, that's a rear-wheel drive-based layout, so longitudinal engine, not transverse. This has a front-wheel drive transaxle over there, 8-speed automatic by ISIN, and an electric axle in the back. That's also very different than the Hyundai and Kia hybrid systems, which use a mechanical all-wheel drive setup and a traditional six-speed automatic up front. In fact, in terms of theory of operation, this is most similar to the brand new Lexus Hybrid Max system we find in the Lexus RX. Traditional automatic transmission, turbocharged engine, e-all-wheel drive setup in the back. But this is a lot more efficient than the setup that we have in the Lexus vehicles. There are a number of reasons for that, of course. One of them is the engine. The engine itself is a lot more efficient than the one we find in the Lexus. Then we get the 8-speed automatic instead of a 6-speed automatic, so we get a larger gear spread. And then there is the way that this vehicle uses the electric motor in the back, because the Lexus is not a plug-in hybrid. The battery pack is absolutely key to the capability of this system. This battery pack is the latest generation one. It's just under 15 kilowatt hours in terms of usable capacity, and it spans from just about the firewall to just about the back of the front seats. It's basically this center console area. Since the vehicle has an e-all-wheel drive setup, it doesn't need a drive shaft to go front and rear, so they were able to use some of the waste space, I guess you could say, for the positioning of the battery. It also puts the battery in a safer place in terms of side impact collisions, and it helps helps move some of the weight from the front to the back, but it doesn't put a big heavy battery pack in the trunk like you find in some plug-in hybrid systems. Dynamically, that's not a great place to put the battery because if the rear end is overly heavy, you can feel a little bit like a pendulum out on the road. So right here in the middle, it makes a lot of sense. But then there's the way the battery pack is used in the system as well. You'll notice that here in the infotainment system, we find four different drive modes, hybrid, power, pure, and constant all-wheel drive. Now let's talk about how everything works together. If the battery is fully charged and the vehicle is set to do so, it will automatically start out in pure mode. That's full EV mode. Basically, it's a rear wheel drive, 143 horsepower electric vehicle. That may not sound like an awful lot, but 228 pound-feet of torque is reasonable, and it's enough to get this vehicle up to highway speeds in about the same zero to 60 time as you'd expect in a mainstream compact crossover. So not overly swift, but definitely acceptable. If you needed more oomph, you simply dive deeper into the throttle, the gas engine comes to life, and you get up to 455 horsepower, and you can go zero to 60 in about 4.1 seconds. Definitely very, very fast. When it is at full throttle, most of the power is happening on the front axle. 312 horsepower up here, 143 horsepower in the back. But if you're not at full throttle and the battery has a reasonable amount of charge, then this does some interesting things. It will actually try and either balance the power 50-50 front and rear if you're in that constant all-wheel drive mode, or it may try and bias power towards the rear if you're in the power mode. That's definitely going to give this more of a rear-wheel drive feel out on the road than any Volvo since they actually had rear-wheel drive Volvos in the 90s. That's the interesting twist with this system and makes it very different than the Lexus Hybrid Max setup because this battery can power that electric motor in its own right. And with the Lexus setup, it can't because it's a much smaller battery. It's not a plug-in hybrid. So if, for instance, you're in constant all-wheel drive mode, yes, the engine is running, but it's running because it's either trying to maintain the charge of the battery to send power to the rear or it's running simply to power the front wheels. If you are in a trickier situation in, say, an XC60 or an XC90 and you need to be able to crawl slowly up uneven surfaces, this will not have to over-rev the engine up front and the front tires to send power to the back. 
In say a Lexus hybrid, the RX hybrid, you will notice that you have to dig deeper into the throttle, the front tires start spinning because that's the only way it can generate enough power to get something to happen in the rear. The battery is just not that large. This battery is about 15 times larger than the one in the Lexus, so it can power that rear electric motor in its own right and really match the wheel speeds front and rear more equitably. But also, because it doesn't have a mechanical connection to the back like we find in a BMW plug-in hybrid or a Hyundai or a Kia plug-in hybrid, the rear electric motor can really do whatever it wants to. Say, for instance, you're out on your favorite winding mountain road, pop the drive mode into power, and you'll notice that you will get rear end rotation more like a rear wheel drive biased all wheel drive system than if you're in the regular hybrid mode. That's because it can choose to overdrive that rear wheel whenever it wants to. Now, it doesn't have a torque vectoring axle in the back in this setup. That's something that would be really cool to see in some future version, but it still means that this has the ability to effectively put more power and more torque to the rear than the front under a wider variety of driving conditions than we found either in the previous T8 system with less power. That one was around 400 horsepower because it had a much less powerful motor in the back or some of those other e-all-wheel drive systems you'll find in the competition. The Volvo T8 system offers some unique advantages we don't find in competitive plug-in hybrid systems. If, for instance, we take a look at a BMW or a Grand Cherokee plug-in hybrid, or even the Lexus Hybrid Max setup, when you're decelerating and regenerative braking, power is going from the wheels through the transmission to the electric motor. And that transmission is downshifting as you're slowing down. So you will certainly notice that sort of halting feel as the transmission is downshifting. It is smoother in some vehicles and rougher in others. We don't feel that at all in the Volvo system because all the regen braking is happening back here on the rear wheels, thanks to that big electric motor. And regen braking is definitely gonna be more aggressive than in the Lexus Hybrid Max system because again, the battery is 15 times larger. So in terms of regenerative braking performance and regenerative braking smoothness, this is actually much closer to the traditional Lexus Hybrid system. You'll find that in the RX 350 with the traditional Lexus Hybrid system, than something like the BMW plug-in hybrid or the Hyundai and Kia plug-in hybrids. Those also have to send power through a stepped automatic transmission as it's downshifting. Now, on the other hand, this is gonna feel more traditional when accelerating, because if you're accelerating with 455 horsepower, you're gonna feel the eight-speed automatic transmission shifting. And that acceleration is gonna feel more aggressive than any vehicle with the same transmission setup up front, because the electric motor can keep on going as you're accelerating. So the engine is doing three to 12 horsepower, it's pausing a little bit as it's shifting, but the rear electric motor is just cooking along the entire time. Unlike a serial plug-in hybrid system, say the Mitsubishi Outlander plug-in hybrid that we currently have as a long-term tester here, this is also gonna be more efficient when operating in hybrid mode because it will run like a regular eight-speed automatic transmission front-wheel drive vehicle without the mechanical losses of an all-wheel drive setup. If it needs to send power to the back, it can send some power to the back from the battery. It can also charge the battery thanks to that 14 horsepower starter generator up front, but it can also operate in the most efficient drive mode for the condition required, which for steady state highway travel with a depleted battery is gonna be front wheel drive in eighth gear, really trying to get the engine RPMs as low as possible, but maintain a mechanical connection between the front wheels and the road. That's one of the reasons that the Outlander plug-in hybrid is significantly less efficient than any of the plug-in hybrid Volvo models, including the big three row XC90. That actually is a little bit more efficient, even though it has about double the power that we find in that Outlander plug-in hybrid. A question I get asked frequently with hybrids and plug-in hybrids is what happens when the pack is completely depleted? Well, the first thing to know is that with more powerful plug-in hybrids like this or some of the BMW plug-in hybrids, you're probably gonna notice it a lot less and it's probably gonna be harder than you think to achieve that condition. Here's why. We still have 312 horsepower from the turbocharged engine under the hood. So even if you were driving really aggressively up the Continental Divide in Colorado, or say you were driving to Tahoe from the Bay Area in California, and you're going up those 10,000 foot mountain passes, you still have 300 horsepower. And that's still an awful lot for a 4,500 pound sedan. If somehow you could magically get yourself to absolute true battery zero, then yes, all you would have left is 312 horsepower. Zero to 60s might stretch out to about six seconds. Passing maneuvers might take a little bit longer, but we're still talking a decent amount of pep. And the moment you let off the throttle a little bit, the software is gonna kick in and start charging that battery pack. So you don't really have to be off the throttle very long before that battery pack has enough oomph to give you all 455 horsepower for another minute or so as you're passing something. So that is truly not much of a concern. 
in off-road situations, you would still end up with a decent amount of power in the uh, more off-road capable Volvos. I wouldn't off-road in an S60, but it's the same setup that we have in the XC60 and XC90. Again, if you hit true zero, here's what the system would do. It would use the 14 horsepower motor generator unit up front to generate power, charge the battery, or send that much oomph to the rear axle. But again, the moment you slow down and you're not demanding that much power, the software will kick in and start recharging the battery. That's why this will run the engine on occasion when you're at a stoplight, for instance. Its purpose in doing that is to charge the battery so that way it's at the right level to give you the performance you expect when the light turns green. If you were truly concerned about it, Volvo also includes a charge mode where you can command the vehicle to try and elevate the charge of the battery pack to either give you EV range or give you that extra power for longer if you really want to. Now let's talk about how this hybrid system drives in the real world. First, let's talk about the more performance oriented modes. Right now we're in power mode, so the engine is on. If I come to a stop and floor it, it takes a tiny bit for the power to get going and then there is a whole lot of it. Zero to 60 happened in this model in four seconds. But the other thing you'll notice versus a four second BMW or Mercedes is the hint of torque steer. So if I floor it, the steering wheel does tug just a little bit. You'll especially notice that around corners like this that you'll get a bit more of a tug than in a BMW or a Mercedes. And that's because there's no mechanical connection front to rear. And most of the power is happening up front. Now, on the other hand, we get a little bit less torque steer than in a number of other front biased vehicles because Volvo uses a double wishbone suspension up front that definitely seems to quell some of those torque steer issues. Now, if I were to put this into constant all wheel drive, then motoring along at this speed at just 30 miles an hour, gentle throttle application, it's sending more power to the rear than it really even was in power mode by all estimations. In this mode, the vehicle is trying to balance power front and rear to give you very sure-footed handling. This is the mode you want to use if you're out on snow, on ice, slippery surfaces, mud, gravel roads, if you're worried about traction, etc. This is going to make this feel very much like a traditional all-wheel drive vehicle, unless you are demanding more than about 295 horsepower, more than about 450 pound-feet of torque. Then it's going to have to bias that power and torque to the front. This is one of the modes where this system is definitely going to feel different than a Lexus hybrid system with the E-axle in the back. Even though those vehicles have maybe about a 90 horsepower motor in the rear, they do not have the ability to equitably split power front and rear, 180 horsepower total say, front and back, without the front wheels spinning a little bit faster than you might want. And you'll really notice that out on snow, on ice, on gravel roads, etc. In order to generate power and send it to the rear, the front tires are just along for the ride and they're just spinning faster than you might want. Some of those situations, that means that you can end up digging deeper into sand or digging deeper into snow and actually getting a little bit more stuck. It's less of a concern in this system, although this cannot send the entire output to just one axle. I've now engaged pure mode, so we have a rear wheel drive vehicle. Volvo allows a reasonable amount of rear wheel slip and traction control management in this mode while keeping the engine off. So if you're worried about just a slight wheel slip intervention from traction control turning on the engine, this will not do that. But if you have extended traction control intervention, then it will turn on the gasoline engine because that's how it sends power to the front. This motor is pretty torquey and you will really notice that on this hill, the rear wheels are definitely slipping going up here and you can have an awful lot of fun in rear wheel drive only mode. This is definitely a lot more powerful than the outgoing model and Volvo has tweaked the software to help it stay in that electric only operation longer. Volvo also tweaked the software to give us one pedal driving. So if I move this back to the B mode, the vehicle will come to a complete stop. And it's pretty aggressive even when the battery is full because it's not using the entire battery. It actually is leaving some reserve there and it allows you to basically fill up a little bit more than you might think, even when the battery is theoretically 100% full. We were just there enough wheel slip that it finally decided to turn on the gasoline engine. Also pretty aggressive on the throttle, but it then very, very quickly went right back to pure mode. Now, if you are driving in pure mode and it does start the engine when it's cold, it's gonna have to heat up the engine. It has to heat up the catalyst to comply with emissions regulations. So it'll take a while before the engine will turn back off. But this mode is definitely very capable. And in pure mode, I was able to do 44 miles of around town driving, about 36 miles of 70 mile an hour steady state driving before the battery pack was depleted. Hybrid mode is fairly self-explanatory. It's gonna lower the threshold where the gasoline engine will kick on if you're too aggressive with the throttle, but it will still stay in EV mode up to 60 miles an hour or above 
You can definitely travel in highway speeds in hybrid mode, but it's going to prioritize the electric operation a little bit less than in the pure mode. Then if we move over to power mode, the gasoline engine will turn back on. Again, the transitions are very seamless because of the design of the system. And this is where you're going to get the most fun driving nature. When you're in power mode and you're out on a winding road like this, even mild throttle application gives this a solid rear wheel drive dynamic. Very minor throttle application, speeds of around 20 miles an hour. The rear end was definitely moving out there because the software is sending more power to the rear and it's driving those rear wheels a little bit faster than the front. The extra power to the rear axle is not going to turn this into a rear tire strutting Ford Mustang or anything like that, but it is going to make this an awful lot more dynamic out on roads like this than you've really ever experienced in a Volvo before. Volvo's R products were an awful lot of fun, but they didn't have this kind of rear power bias. They were really more of a neutral all-wheel drive thing. I actually had a V70R back in 2006. This is actually more fun. Even though we get a little bit less grip and a whole lot of curb weight, 4,500 pounds here, uh, this could use some wider tires, but dynamically, this is absolutely fantastic. There are times that the suspension sort of skitters across the pavement. That coupled with the all season tires and just 235 width means that this feels very lively, but lively in this strangely balanced way that no Volvo has in quite some time. The battery pack location gives this a near perfect weight balance. Volvo won't give us specific weight balance figures, but it's pretty close to 50-50. That combined with the ability to send all that torque to the rear axle really gives this a very different personality than you might suspect. Does that give this Volvo the dynamics to match a BMW or a Mercedes? In a word, no. This is not that kind of dynamic all-wheel drive system, but it is an awful lot of fun and it's very efficiency focused. We've been averaging nearly 35 miles per gallon over a week of driving when operating just as a hybrid. That is absolutely fantastic and definitely solid electric range when operating as an EV as well. Thanks for taking the time to check out this video. Hopefully that answers all of your burning questions when it comes to Volvo's plug-in hybrid systems. There are a few different Volvo plug-in hybrids depending on where you're watching this video around the world, but this is the only one offered in the United States. If you're in Europe, then you do have a really intriguing dual clutch based plug-in hybrid system, which I really would love to test in the US, but Volvo has chosen not to bring it here in the XC40. So if you live in one of those countries, definitely check that one out. It's kind of a cool system. But also if you're looking for a solid, high efficiency, high performance plug-in hybrid system with definitely some quirky features and a really engaging drive that I think is kind of endearing in a different sort of way, definitely check out the Volvo plug-in hybrid system. If you demand pure rear wheel drive dynamics, if you really want a solid mechanical all wheel drive system, that is not gonna be found in Volvo's plug-in hybrid system. There are pros and cons to this, but the big advantage with Volvo's system is the way that it can handle that electric motor on the back and the efficiency that the entire thing gives you. 31 miles per gallon in the S60 is definitely significantly above the competition at the moment, and you still get 41 miles of all electric range. Let me know what you think about all that down there. Hit the subscribe button if you haven't already done so. Check out the related content, and of course, check out the full video of the S60. You'll find that over on the other channel. See all of you later.